Today, we focus on National Human Rights Institutions, or NHRIs. Here's a brief overview of what we'll discuss. We'll first talk about what NHRIs actually are, what sorts of functions and activities they perform, what are the different types or modes of NHRIs that have been created, and what sorts of challenges have they faced, and what sorts of achievements have they accomplished. Let's start with the first question about what an NHRI actually is. This is distinctive because it's a government-created institution, that is, it is part of the apparatus of the state, created either by a constitutional rule or a legislation that mandates protection and promotion of human rights within a specific country. These are, on the whole, country-specific institutions. As part of the state, NHRIs are governed by domestic law, but one of the requirements for their functioning properly is that they be independent of the state in which they are a part. So they are autonomous in that sense, and that's important because one of the principal functions that they have is to hold governments accountable in some way for human rights violations. Let's take a look in more detail at some of the functions and activities of NHRIs. First, they promote domestic implementation of international human rights standards, whether in treaties or customary international law. They also promote compliance with the recommendations of the UN human rights process, such as the treaty bodies, the UPR process, as well as the judgments of regional human rights courts if the country at issue is within one of those regions that has a human rights court. They promote public awareness about human rights standards within the domestic context. They cooperate with NGOs at different levels of society. And they also, in some cases, investigate and resolve complaints. So they have a sort of quasi-judicial function, although that's not true for all NHRIs. And the extent to which the findings of NHRIs can then be reviewed in court also varies from country to country. One of the other activities of NHRIs is to influence the development of international norms through UN and regional human rights venues. NHRIs are often participants in these venues and they shape how human rights law evolves. Let's talk about some of the different kinds of NHRIs that exist. So first of all, you should know that NHRIs go by a variety of names, commission, ombudsman, public defender or prosecutor, public advocate, and so forth. Some of the differences among NHRIs are with respect to the powers that they hold, the resources that they have from the state, their relationship to other public actors such as courts and prosecutors. So there's a lot of variation here from country to country. And in order to ensure that NHRIs meet at least a minimum international standard, there is an accreditation process by an international coordinating committee of NHRIs that determines whether NHRIs are fully, partly, or not compliant with international minimum standards. And those minimum standards are set forth, among other sources, in the Paris Principles relating to the status and functioning of national institutions to promote human rights. Now let's turn to a few examples of some of the accomplishments and achievements of NHRIs, and then some examples where NHRIs have not been as effective. Here's an example of an NHRI in Ghana in the mid-1990s, known as the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. One of the things this NHRI did during this period was to conduct a nationwide inspections of prisons and police lockups to review compliance with minimum international standards for the treatment of detainees and prisoners. And perhaps not surprisingly, the investigation uncovered serious overcrowding and poor sanitation problems in these holding facilities and prisons. The commission issued a detailed report about its findings and it conducted follow-up visits. And the report contained a number of recommendations regarding the treatment of prisoners that the government of Ghana later implemented. So this is what you might think of as a success story with a fairly direct con connection between the activities of the NHRI and 
the resulting improvement of human rights standards. Here's a different example where the connection between the NHRI's activities and a positive outcome is a little more attenuated. Also in the mid-1990s, the National Commission on Human Rights in Indonesia investigated military killings of civilians in a particular region in that country. The commission went to the site of the alleged atrocities, interviewed witnesses, and issued a strongly worded report that condemned these violations, identified them as violations, and recommended legal action against those responsible. The government here did not follow those recommendations. The government at the time was autocratic, and the Commission's activities were part of a number of efforts by civil society groups and human rights advocates to pressure the regime to improve its performance with respect to the protection of rights and limiting the powers of the military. And the Commission's actions bolstered this larger civil society movement and ultimately helped to bring about a regime change in the late 1990s. So those are some of the success stories, if you will, or achievements. Let's talk about some shortcomings. And here I've given you three examples, one from Fiji in 2007, where the NHRI issued a report that essentially whitewashed a military coup. And having done that, the NHRI was largely marginalized and viewed as a political actor, not independent, and thus really no longer effective, even after there had been a response to that military coup. In Nepal in the 2000s, the situation was somewhat different. Here, the government failed to appoint members of the commission or provided with adequate funds to investigate abuses that occurred during a long-standing civil war. A third example is Togo in the late 1990s, where the government expanded the commission's formal powers but pressured it not to investigate complaints against security forces or others who were close to the officials in power. Here's an example of government that formally seems to follow the international template for creating and staffing an NHRI, but in practice pressures it not to investigate. All of these examples are situations of NHRIs that would not be deemed compliant with international minimum standards. This lecture gives you a brief overview to the issues involving NHRIs, and I invite you to consider some additional sources if you're interested in further information.